We are really honored that all of you have come, found the time to come. And we are, of course, greatly privileged that Professor Avijit Patak is here to, uh, with us and to give us a talk. We need no introduction for him. He's one of uh, uh, India's best known public intellectuals. Uh, Professor Patak ki Shurvat me initially uh, uh, government schools ki mes padhai karke, fir physics ki padhai shuru ki thi, aur uske baad unhone uh, turn lekar sociology me entry le li, aur uh, uh, JNU se unhone padhai ki thi, jiske baad wo uh, Calcutta me ek bahut premier research institute me unhone kam karna shuru kiya, uh, aur बहुत कॉन्शियसली जानबूझकर उन्होंने रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट से निकलकर एक ऐसी यूनिवर्सिटी में आना पसंद किया जहां पर पढ़ाने का मौका मिलता है यह सोच के मैं पढ़ाना चाहता हूं तो जवाहरलाल नेहरू विश्वविद्यालय आए थे और जवाहरलाल नेहरू विश्वविद्यालय में ये 30 साल 31 साल सर ने पढ़ाया है और अभी पिछले साल रिटायर हुए हैं प्रोफेसर पाठक वहां के शायद सबसे स्टूडेंट्स में सबसे प्रिय टीचर्स में से रहे हैं इनका काम स्टूडेंट्स के साथ भी बहुत ही मतलब जैसे कहते हैं कि जो 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 प्यार का जो एक रिश्ता है और प्यार के रिश्ते से जो स्टूडेंट्स पर जो असर होता है उस तरह से एक अप्रोच रहा है इनका स्टूडेंट्स के साथ वेरी करिश्मेटिक टीचर आप देख ही लेंगे जब जब ये बोलना शुरू करेंगे और बहुत सारे स्टूडेंट्स के साथ बहुत अच्छा एक रिश्ता बना कर रखना है जिसमें से कई खुशकिस्मत लोग हम लोग यहाँ भी बैठे हुए हैं उनके साथ से पढ़े हुए प्रोफेसर पाठक का अपना काम जो है और जिसमें से वो शिक्षा के बारे में जैसे वो सोचते हैं उसमें बहुत सेंट्रल बात ये रही है कि शिक्षा एक तरह का एक भारतीय संस्कृति में जो कई तरह की आवाजें हैं शिक्षा उसमें से चयन करते हुए डिस्कस करते हुए उसमें से विकसित कुछ बातों को हम शिक्षा कहते हैं शिक्षा और संस्कृति दोनों में कई तरह की आवाजें होती हैं और जिनमें आपस में टसल भी रहती है और जिनके बारे में हमें लगातार अपने विवेक से सोचने सोचते रहने की जरूरत है कि शिक्षा में आखिर क्या पढ़ाएं और क्यों पढ़ाएं इनके इस पर कई तरह के लेखन है एक किताब इनकी है जो कि मैं तो कम से कम अपने स्टूडेंट्स को कहता हूं कि अगर आपको शिक्षा पर दो ही किताबें पढ़नी है एक तो आपको प्रोफेसर कृष्ण कुमार की पॉलिटिकल एजेंडा ऑफ एजुकेशन पढ़ लीजिए दूसरा मैं कहता हूं कि इनकी किताब पढ़ें इनकी किताब का नाम एजुकेशन एंड मॉरल क्वेस्ट रिकॉर्डिंग द फॉरगॉटन जो अब हिंदी अनुवाद में भी उपलब्ध है हिंदी में इसका शीर्षक है शिक्षा और नैतिक मूल्यों की खोज नैतिक मूल्यों पर अक्सर बहुत शैलो किस्म की बातें की जाती है मॉरल मोरलिटी मॉरल एजुकेशन बहुत शैलो किस्म की बातें की जाती है प्रोफेसर पाठक की जो किताब है उसमें आप ये पाएंगे कि सोशल थ्योरी का जो सबसे एडवांस किस्म का काम है उसके इस्तेमाल से मॉरलिटी मॉरल एजुकेशन कल्चर कल्चर की पॉलिटिक्स के ऊपर इन्होंने बहुत गहराई से सोचा भी है और लिखा भी है आप, आप, मुझे बहुत खुशी है प्रोफेसर पाठक ने हम लोगों का इनविटेशन एक्सेप्ट किया यहाँ आने के लिए और मैं उनसे निवेदन करूंगा कि वो आ जाए आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू आजिम प्रेमज यूनिवर्सिटी आई एडमायर दिस प्लेस बिकॉज दिस मॉर्निंग आई वॉज टेलिंग अमन दैट नॉट मेनी प्लेसेस आर लेफ्ट नाउ यू नो हु जेनरेट होप होप इन ए न्यू पॉसिबिलिटी Now, Wajim Premji University is one of those rare institutions. Bangalore campus I visited, and this is a new one, and with a great possibility. And I am I really thank the organizers for making it possible, for giving me an opportunity to come here and to meet this esteemed audience and to share some of my views with you. And another reason that excites me is that i am in bhopal a place known for its cultural syncretism its religious pluralism and that's a great thing to celebrate 
the vision of pluralism and the vision of religious syncretism great thing to celebrate and it is a place of artist it is a place of theater a long history so i am really happy and excited that i am here and i could interact with you and you belong to different disciplines and you did not be and for this lecture you need not belong to any particular area of specialization if we are students if we are students of life if we see ourselves as students of life and if we broaden the meaning of education beyond exams degrees certificates grades then i think that all of us would be able to identify with what i am going to speak and let me begin let me begin with a dream in early 1990 when i joined the university and chose the vocation of teaching there was a dream and i was driven by that dream and that dream was essentially a quest a search and that search was for some kind of surplus i knew officially what teaching means i knew that you complete your phd you apply for a job experts interview you you get selected you earn monthly salary and there is an official syllabus that you complete you take exams you discipline students you grade them you hierarchize them you are a mediator between the official curriculum and the students so i knew that's the official definition of being a teacher as an educational manager as a professional as a paid employee but it was very difficult for me to remain contented with that definition only that that is what a teacher does only and here there was a quest and this is what we call the quest for the surplus that there ought to be something more in this vocation than this vocation of being a teacher and to cultivate that dream and to encourage me to cherish that dream to celebrate that dream many kind of conversation took place and i conversed philosophically intellectually ethically morally with a spectrum of thinkers you know and it was a very non reductionist search in a way the way paulo freire would fascinate me in a similar way jiddu krishnamurthy's writings on education would strike my imagination would fascinate me so i was learning from paulo freire that entire notion of problem posing education critical pedagogy dialogue that children or the students are not empty vessels to be bombarded by the teacher's monologue instead teacher and student together redefine the world problematize the world collectively explores the world raises critical questions and goes ahead so prayer was in the mind fascinated us likewise krishnamurthy's famous speech when he came out of the theosophical society and he became a wanderer truth is a pathless land and that was the title of that speech in other words to strive for truth to strive for knowledge and ideas one has to be lost into a forest one has to be lost into different possibilities different ideas and a learner a teacher a student is a perpetual wanderer constantly exploring examining reexamining you know it was a life of being a wanderer and no learning is complete if we lose that capacity of being a wanderer and that's why there is no fixed straight cut unilinear road to truth you know it's just you have to be lost into ideas into realm of ideas and the task of a teacher i felt is possibly the one 
to throw students into a turbulent ocean and let the student learn to swim and find, explore. The task of a teacher is not to make the life of the student easy with ready-made formula, ready-made solution, ready-made answer. Instead, the task is to excite them, to arouse a sense of wonder. So that was a source of inspiration from Paulo Freire to Jiddu Krishnamurti. And likewise, American feminist thinker who continually interrogated racism and patriarchy in her classroom. Tremendously wonderful writer whom we lost recently, Bell Hooks, Teaching to Transgress, her fascinating books, her descriptions of the pedagogy, the way she used to transform the classroom and bring about learners, students' experiences in the process of classroom conversation and dialogue. That was a great source of inspiration. So on the one hand, Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks, on the other, Jiddu Krishnamurti, and then of course, Rabindranath Tagore, Tagore's poetic universalism, Tagore's aesthetics, quest for aesthetic education. So it was like a spectrum. It was like a rainbow. And that's why I always felt somewhat uneasy with those who very quickly arrive at a final conclusion. I was felt always uneasy with my very deterministic Marxist friends or deterministic Gandhian friends or Ambedkarite friends as if they have found the formula, ultimate key. Everything can be answered. Every could, everything could be comprehended through that system. That's the new charge, new Bible. That orthodoxy, that determinism, that reductionism never fascinated me. So what fascinated me was that the spectrum of ideas and how one was constantly negotiating with that. And that, I think, generated that dream that a teacher, of course the teacher does the official work, comes to the class, complete the syllabus, takes the exam, earns his or salary, but there is something more. And that's why this vocation is beautiful. It's a wonderful vocation. And that dream, I felt, makes this vocation very meaningful. So I often tell myself, from March 1990 to December 2021, for more than 31 years, summer or winter, early morning, foggy morning in Delhi, 9 a.m. clash or afternoon May sun, 3 p.m. clash, I could come to the classroom with a lot of energy and joy and enthusiasm because I felt that when I entered the classroom or the university, I get an opportunity to meet hundreds of possibilities, young minds with new questions, new ideas, new possibilities. So a sense of gratitude, a sense of gratitude that was surrounding my existence and that gave a lot of joy and meaning to this vocation. So while cherishing that dream and trying to implement that dream, there were three things that I was constantly contemplating and it was giving a meaning to the way I began to look at the meaning of being a teacher. One is about the idea of a classroom, the teacher and the student. As co-travelers walking together, collectively exploring the world through science, through maths, through poetry, through politics, through aesthetics, through cinema, <laughs> examining the world, probing the world, and trying to make sense of the world, teacher and the student as co-traveler working together, collectively exploring the world together. And that exploration, that collective walking is possible only if there are three things. And these three things become very important component of my dream. One is the dialogue. And the second is the compassionate listening. And third is engaged pedagogy. So when I say dialogue, Amon does a lot of good work on the question of dialogue and conflict resolution. So when I speak of dialogue, let me just make two or three points. 
So what I tell my students that we should have a dialogue. We should learn from one another, critically examine. Now the dialogue does not mean, does not mean consensus. When you and I are engaged in a dialogue and conversation, it does not mean that we and you and I necessarily arrive at a consensus, that there is no difference between us. That's not the dialogue. That's not the purpose of dialogue. That's not necessarily the outcome of dialogue. But dialogue essentially means in the process of conversation, you and I acknowledge our living presence. We are not objects. We are not things. We are not program. Instead, we are possibilities. We are blooming flowers. We are blooming continually. So dialogue is impossible without the acknowledgement of the living presence of the other. If I castigate you, if I objectify you, if I reduce you into a thing, if I have already arrived at a final decision about you, I am not interested in you. I cannot have a conversation with you. So dialogue requires what philosopher Martin Buber in a different context would argue not the I eat relationships, but I thou relationship, a relationship of reciprocity, a relationship of mutuality, a relationship of two living consciousness, not a subject and the object duality, but the relationships of two beings, two living consciousness. Second component of dialogue is that even if it does not arrive at a consensus, it always generates the possibility of the expansion of horizon, expansion of mental horizon. I'll just give you an illustration. We all know that from 20s to late 30s, Gandhiji and Dr. Ambedkar differed significantly on the issue of caste, primarily on the question of caste, representation and politics. Gandhi and Ambedkar did not agree most of the time. But what happened to that conversation, that dialogue, was that there was an expansion of origin. And that expansion of origin could be seen the way Gandhi's reflection on Varnasram system and the caste in the 1920s, and when in 1935, Gandhi was writing an article in Harijan and saying the title of the article is caste must go, you know, and Gandhi's more and more critical position on the question of caste. And that was what dialogue does. It led to the expansion of horizons. Rudraksha Mukherjee recently came forward with a beautiful book on Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi's conversations and the dialogues. They differed on many issues, say non-cooperation, Tagore had strong reservations about the essential philosophy of non-cooperation. And then Tagore was not very happy with Gandhi's reading of earthquake in Bihar, that it was a God is not happy, you know. Now, but despite these differences, there was a constant learning between the two. And I always feel one of the archival pictures that Tagore and Gandhi sitting under a tree at Shantaniketan and a lot of young minds are just sitting, a wonderful thing, a wonderful picture. They're constantly engaging in a conversation with each of them. Before initiating any movement, despite the differences, Gandhi would take Tagore's blessings. And Tagore at one place would say that when we differ with Gandhi, I find myself a stranger because I admire his sincerity. But this is something I disagree with. So, as I said in the morning also, I was saying, in dialogue, even if there is not agreement, there is a possibility of expansion of origin. And in dialogue, there is no hate speech. Dialogue is an antithesis of hate speech. Dialogue is about the mutuality, acknowledgement of each other. In a world in which, for example, our sentiments are hurt so instantly, so quickly, in a world where we are not willing to listen to one another because we objectify other. 
we already arrive at a final conclusion about others or we castigate others in such a world i believe how this dream of the dialogue that every teacher ought to cultivate every teacher ought to cherish now dialogue if and then dialogue is impossible without compassionate listening listening is not just hearing listening meaningful listening is a compassionate listening and that listening today as we see again how this has become very important to cherish is becoming increasingly impossible in the age of hate speech in the age of intolerance and when we begin to listen to others compassionately we need not necessarily agree but as i have said that the possibility that emerges is that that each of us as a partner in the dialogue begin to expand each other's horizon our understanding of the world slowly slowly begins to alter new ideas emerge new ideas come and this is where lot of compassionate listening takes place i often give an illustration to my students used to give an illustration to my students that see that what a beautiful idea took place in the world so what we call the entire new left critical theories Herbert Marcuse, Eric Fromm, Theodor Adorno, their writings, and see the way they conversed with Marx as well as with Sigmund Freud. You know, see Eric Fromm's writings. You know, beyond the chains of illusions, my encounter with Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. It's an extraordinarily beautiful book, The Art of Loving, Eric Fromm's book. Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. eros and civilization now these are the works which emerged out of that fluidity of the mind fluidity of the consciousness so reduction is deterministic marxist who are not very happy with critical theory nor was deterministic psychoanalysts who are very happy with the kind of thing that eric from and herbert marcuse did because they bring lot of politics into it lot of critical theory into it lot of marx into it especially the marxist young marxist writing on alienation strangement and others so listening that was possible because of listening compassionate listening so can our classroom be a site of dialogue be a site of listening that i think was the dream that i used to cherish and that dream drove me to this vocation so dialogue compassionate listening with that the engaged pedagogy now when i speak the word engaged pedagogy this word engage i derive from the buddhist monk kuchnathan see his thing the vietnam war he was a very young monk but he was feeling a question was haunting him that what my religiosity is all about is it only about my personal salvation personal nirvan and the quest can i remain happy in an unhappy world in a discontented world or is it required that my religiosity has to engage itself with the larger struggle in the world and that question drove him and he talked about engaged buddhism and that led him to work with martin luther king jr and part of the peace movement in the world you know and this is where and throughout his long journey this buddhist monk you could see the reflections on the engaged pedagogy and the dialogue some of you must have read the one of his wonderful book living buddha living christ the way he is engaging with buddhism and christianity simultaneously you know and out of that this book come living buddha and living christ now at a time when we are concerned with what one is wearing one's dress one food at the time when you see a work of this kind when you see a work of this kind you see the elasticity of human consciousness it plurality it cosmopolitanism the possibility of see beyond 
expand the horizons. And that is, as the monk could say, engaged religiosity. I would take that word engaged and use the word engaged pedagogy. Now this classroom, what is happening, and the way we are engaging in dialogue or listening, that has a big role to play in the way we relate to the larger world outside the classroom, you know. Now, if we are cherishing dialogue, can we remain contented if we see a world that abhors the spirit of dialogue? If we see a world that is totalitarian, that is not comfortable with conversation, with dialogue, we would not. Then what we would try to do? We would try to create a larger awareness so that we could transform the society. The way in engaged religiosity, it is not just my personal salvation and happiness. The world is unhappy. The structure itself breeds violence. Now how I engage with that? Likewise, the engaged pedagogy will take us to the larger world. Its polity, its economy, its social movements, you know. And that was the dream of, you know, that I cherished. And that dream gave a meaning to life. And gave a meaning to life. And I felt, with a deep gratitude, I feel that for 31 years, I did a job where, to borrow Marx's word, there was not the slightest stress of alienation because I was not alienated from myself in the process of my work. I was not alienated from the students with whom I was working every day. So it was a moment of celebration. It was a moment of joy. And this, I believe, was a beautiful aspect of the vocation of teaching. It is relational, you know. It is relational. It is about the idea of a better world. It is about cultivating those sensibilities of critical consciousness, dialogue, compassionate listening, art of seeing. And this, I think, you know, was the dream. But why I have chosen to speak on this theme that the meaning of being a teacher today. Now, what this today is all about? And that, I think, is very important. I often talk to my many young students who have just joined the vocation of teaching, started teaching in colleges and others. I often see pessimism in their eyes. They are 31, 32, 33, and they often tell me, nothing is possible, sir. Nothing is going to happen, you know. Nothing is possible, nothing could be done. We are burdened with the course load, teacher-student ratio, external pressure. Nothing is going to happen. I see dreams are dying so fast. I see young teachers losing all hope and becoming behaving like any other paid employees, you know. Just at the end of the month, I get my salary. But there is nothing extraordinary in this act of teaching. Many of these young teachers now begin to say that. That's very frightening. That's very frightening. In the morning, I was just we were gradually conversing with young students in the university. So you were saying that a generation that has lost its wonder, a generation that has lost its dream, that would frighten us. That is very dangerous, you know. Now, this is where I just wish to reflect that what is it happening, you know, that led many of these otherwise bright young minds to be pessimist today, who are in the field of teaching, they are very much pessimist today. One reason that I wish to share with you, possibly most of you would agree with me, is what, you know, can be regarded broadly as the neoliberal assault on education. So when you speak of the neoliberal attack on education, I mean the discourse of market fundamentalism. When the market fundamentalism colonizes the spheres of education and learning, then slowly and slowly and eventually 
major damages begin to take place. It is not just about the extraordinary fee that many of the fancy institutes of technology and management and the private universities charge. It is more than that. It is deeply existential, psychological and pedagogic challenges and the crisis that neoliberalism has done to education. See what happens. The first thing, because of the colonization of the sphere of education by the logic of market fundamentalism, what, is, what matters is the rationality of the market. That is supreme rationality. Everything else has to surrender before the logic of the market. So as a result, what happens? Slowly and slowly, popular perception of education and our perception of education undergoes a massive metamorphosis. The kind of education that Paul Fair, Bell Hooks, Rabindranath Tagore, Jiddu Krishnamurti, or any other critical pedagogue is talking about, that is thrown into dustbin. Education is reduced into mere training. As the American Canadian, you know, great sociologist of education, Henry Giro, regards it, that education is first becoming mere training. Education is becoming just a mere instrumental technical learning and education and teachers are getting transformed into mere service provider, skill provider, and students are losing the spirit of studentship. Studentship is about questioning, knowing, exploring, wonder. So all that would disappear and students are becoming increasingly consumers. Consumers of diverse packages of technical instrumental knowledges. And once you are a consumer, you are essentially a product with a brand. And see how shamelessly we advertise today our educational institution, that psychology, what neoliberalism has done. 20 corporate houses have visited our campus. Average salary is 60 lakh per annum. You know, now at a time when middle class parents are engaged in shopping in the education mall, which college, placement history, and the salary package. When I look at my child as a potential product with the attractive placement and the salary package, I have already done what Karl Marx in Capital Volume 1 long back was visualizing and regarding it as commodity fetishism. That relationship between you and me no longer is a relationship between two living beings, two living autonomous persons and consciousness. It is a relationship of two objects and two commodities with price tax. We are all marketable product today and commodities today. Only yesterday when I was coming in the flight, I saw that airlines magazine and 80% is about those education shops and about the story of placement and salary package. But what is shocking really is one of those institute has an ad where their professors they have reduced to them into attractive packages and the brand. Big names and this name sell. So these are the retired vice chancellor of this university. You know, retired professor of that and then photograph. And it was like, they are the brand ambassadors. You know, they are the brand ambassadors. So see the way our self-perception is altering. The way we have begun to define ourselves today is first altering. And the way the classroom is going to be severely affected because of the neoliberal assault on education. That I think is one of the things that most of us ought to think about what is going to happen in the vocation of teaching in our time today. Second, I think another thing which we all ought to talk about, you know, when Krishnamurti talked about that no organized church, no organized religion, no sect, no dogma can take me to the truth. You know, I have to be a I have to quest it, I have to search it, I have to be a perpetual wanderer. 
and that's why the truth is a pathless land. But imagine you live in an age where certain kind of reductionist, exclusivist ideologies in the name of caste, religion, nationality become dominant. And that begin to cloud your vision. Cloud your thinking. Then what happens? The very idea of education, as I said, expansion of origin, expansion of origin, new possibilities, dialogue, that tend to disappear because now I begin to see the world through the prism of that particular fixed exclusivist idea. It could come in the name of nation, it could come in the name of religion, nationality, ethnicity, it could come from anything and it would limit my vision. Now imagine, possibly if you talk to a sensitive teacher today, school teacher in an Indian classroom, sensitive teacher, and if you ask that, can you introduce your student to a great piece of poetry by Alama Iqbal because Iqbal was much more than just as this day he would be regarded as a separatist. He was much more than that. Extraordinary poet, philosopher, sensitive. Now is it possible for a school teacher to feel very certain that he or she could do it today? Now there is a doubt, there is an anxiety and in an age of surveillance, in an age of surveillance when everything that you speak could be reduced into a viral video and immediately the FIRs can be filed against you. Now is it possible to keep that spirit of free floating conversation, dialogue and conversation in our classrooms? That's a question that haunts many. That's a question that haunts many. But see the possibility that when we cross that, cross that, and that's why Tagore's last convocation speech, what is, when he was that, uh, coming as a booklet, Crisis in Civilization, and Tagore reminder again and again that the idea of hyper-exclusivist nationalism can prove to be a monster, you know, and Europe was experiencing that with the growth of fascism, with the growth of totalitarianism. So the idea of a very hyper militant exclusivist nationalism can prove to be a monster. Staggered plea for cosmopolitanism, the dialogue, the conversations, you know, and expansion of the mind, you know, expansion of the heart and the mind. Now, I think that education, liberating education, meaningful education ought to create that mind, a mind that has a sense of wonder, a mind that refuses to confine itself to a pond, a mind that wants to enter into the ocean, you know, and that plurality, that expansion. Now, I think that any kind of adherence to a very, very rigid exclusivist doctrine, no matter how sanctified it becomes because of the politics, that creates violence. Not only the physical violence, it creates symbolic violence, it creates psychic violence. And our classrooms today are filled with this psychic and symbolic violence. And that is one of the major challenge today, you know, to retain the dream with which I began. And the third, I will just end that it's very unfortunate today that 13,089 students, according to the Government of India report, committed suicide in 2021. And in this month, Already 25 suicides took place in the notorious town in Rajasthan, known for gigantic coaching factories. Kota, 25 suicides have already taken place in this month. 
IITs and NITs from 2018 to 2021, IIT 61, NIPs and IIMs, around 88 suicides have taken place. And like climate emergency, we are in a state of denial. I have often tried to communicate it with many middle class parents and teachers. This is what is happening with your child. But there is a state of denial. There is a state of denial. Unless my child commits suicide, I want to wake up. You know. Now, this is what is happening. And coaching center strategist, this physics sir, this mathematics sir, this chemistry sir, you know, have replaced all great teachers, all great pedagogues, you know. And this is where great books have been replaced by success manuals, by guidebooks. And our children are growing up in an environment of that kind. In that world, there is no sunrise, there is no sunset, there is no painting, no music, no literature, no creativity. In that world, there is only the fear of high, hugely problematic standardized tests. And only skill that you need to develop is the speed and efficiency to tick the correct answer on the OMR sheet. That's the studentship growing up in front of you. Your child, my child, your neighbor's child, they are growing up. Many of them, in the process of growing up, would never come across a good teacher, a great teacher. They would find coaching center strategists with their success manuals. But seldom will they find a teacher who tell them, with Jiddu Krishnamurti, in one of his conversation with students in a valley school, was saying that, I know you are pretty good in physics and mathematics, but how many of you have watched the sunset in the valley? Uh, watching sunset is as important as doing physics and mathematics. Now, it's like when he was making that statement, you know, or when Ben Hooks in the classroom, in our classroom, a black woman who was silent for quite some time because of the white domination, one day, because of Ben Hooks' dialogic capacity, she would come forward, speak of her experience, you know, and feel herself liberated. And after the class, she would hug her teacher, Bell Hooks, and say that you made it possible. Today I got my agency. I was suppressed, racially suppressed, patriarchy suppressed me. But today I see myself as human, as a creative human subject, articulating my voice. A coaching center strategist would not do it. Physics wallers and chemistry wallers would not do it. You know, that requires meaningful classroom and the great teachers. If we do not realize it, out of that 13,089 suicide, next year someone might be from your home. You know, now this is where the idea of the vocation, the challenge of the vocation. I'll just end with a note. When I see my students who have joined the vocation of teaching with a lot of pessimism, I tell them that, and I would borrow from Antonio Gramsci's quote, and in the prison notebooks he wrote it, pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. So when you think only intellectually, rationally, you might arrive at a very pessimistic conclusion. Everything is gone. Everything is finished. Nothing is going to happen. That's the pessimism of the intellect. But Gramsci could sustain himself. In Mussolini's dark cell, the prison, he could still acquire the creativity and the courage to write on Italian culture, poetry, painting, Marxism, philosophy of praxis, intellectuals. That was because of the optimism of the will. Now, pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. And I think today one of the important challenge in front of a teacher, not to get carried away by the pessimism of the intellect, but to cherish the optimism of the will. And with that optimism of the will, 
to act as a catalyst and evolve the pedagogy of hope. And that pedagogy of hope can emerge only if in our classrooms we can create that awareness in the mind of a young learner that another vision of the world, another imagination of the world beyond neoliberal techno-capitalism, beyond all sorts of fundamentalism, exclusionary ideals, a world tormented by climate emergency, electoral autocracy, rising authoritarianism, cult of narcissism. In a world of this kind, to heal that world, we need another imagination of the world, another vision of the world. And that another vision of the world, that another imagination of the world, no authoritarian master can provide. It can happen silently, beautifully, only through great teachers in thousands and thousands of our classrooms. And with that optimism of the will, I would end and thank you once again for listening to me. It's a great honor you know, that you are here and I could share my ideas with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Teachers who are sincere bhi hain aur vidwan bhi bahut kam aajkal aap jaise milte hain sir ne kai tarah ki baatein ki hain bahut sari kai sari baatein ki hain mool roop se shayad unhone kaha hai ki jo shiksha ka jo unka nazariya hai wo ek aisa nazariya jo pehla to sambhav par aadharit hai na ki kisi fixed ideology par lekin sambhav par aadharit hai और ऐसा एक शिक्षा का नजरिया जो कि सुनने पर आधारित है करुणा के भाव से लोगों के की बात सुनने चाहे चाहे वो कितना भी जैसा भी दुष्ट व्यक्ति हो लेकिन क्या मैं सुन सकता हूँ उसकी बात को समझ सकता हूँ इस पर आधारित और तीसरा इनमें कहा था कि और इसमें एक इंगेजमेंट का एक नजरिया कि शिक्षक का एक की समझ अपने आप की कि वो सिर्फ अपने सिलेबस और अपनी नौकरी से ही संबंधित नहीं है वो तो हम हैं ही लेकिन सिर्फ उसी के साथ संबंधित नहीं है लेकिन जो दुनिया के जो दुख है उसे भी अपने आप के साथ जोड़कर एक शिक्षक अपना काम करने की कोशिश करे एक एंगेज पैटोकॉपी क्या ये कर सकते हैं आप ये चुनौती सर ने अपने आप अपने लिए ली है और इसी तरह इन्होंने कोशिश की और काफी हद तक मुझे लगता है कामयाब तरीके से कोशिश की जो ये कहते हैं कि आज के जो सबसे बड़ी जो जो चैलेंजेस ऐसे शिक्षक के लिए हैं जो कि इस तरह से एक संवाद भी करना चाह रहे हैं और छात्रों की अपनी जिंदगी के दरवाजे उनके लिए खोलना चाह रहे हैं दरवाजे दरवाजे खोलने के अपना मतलब अक्सर रहता है कि सिर्फ नौकरियों से दरवाजे खुलते हैं हाँ नौकरियों से दरवाजे खुलते ही हैं वो तो है ही लेकिन बहुत सारे चीज़ों के लिए हमारे दरवाजे हमारे सोचने के तरीकों से खुलते हैं हमारी भावनाओं के तरीकों से खुलते हैं किस तरह की भावनाओं से चलते हैं वो क्या शिक्षक उन्होंने बहुत खूबसूरत वेलुक्स का उदाहरण दिया कि जिसमें एक 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 छात्र अपनी टीचर को गले लगाकर कह सकती है कि आपके आपके कारण मैं जिन दरवाजों में बंद थी मेरे लिए वो दरवाजे खुल गए क्या एक ऐसे ऐसे शिक्षक की हम कल्पना कर सकते हैं और जो जो इसकी इसकी चुनौतियां हैं बड़े स्पष्ट रूप से उन्होंने बताया एक तो यही कि कि जहाँ शिक्षा और और शिक्षक दोनों का स्वरूप सिर्फ कॉम्पिटेटिव एग्जाम पास करने तक रह गया है वो वहाँ के कैसे कर सकते हैं वहाँ तो बहुत मुश्किल है अगर माँ बाप और बच्चे यही पूछे हैं कि आपने मुझको नंबर दिलाए कि नहीं दिलाए यही शिक, अच्छे शिक्षक के लक्षण हैं तो फिर ये नजरिया कहाँ से आ सकता है शिक्षा जहाँ एक ऐसा ऐसा एक समाज हम बना रहे हैं विश्व भर में कि जहाँ पर लोग अपने बड़ी नैरो संकीर्ण आइडियोलॉजीज में फंस गए हैं और उसमें इतने इनसेक्योर हैं कि कोई थोड़ा सा भी सवाल करता तो कहते तुमने तो ऐसे कैसे कह दिया हम तो झगड़ा करेंगे तुम्हारे साथ जब हम ऐसे समाज की तरफ बढ़ रहे हैं तब भी शिक्षक की बातें कैसे कर सकते हैं जहाँ कहे कि सुनो तो सही दूसरी की बात सुनो समझने की कोशिश करो उसमें भी इनको उम्मीद है उसमें भी इन्हें उम्मीदें हैं हाँ और बिल्कुल सही उम्मीद है ये तो उम्मीद बिल्कुल जायज है कि फिर भी हम लोग फिर भी हम लोग इंसान हैं हमें एक क्षमता है सोचने की हम में विल की क्षमता है हम 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 इच्छा रख सकते हैं और इच्छा रख सकते हैं कि एक ऐसे ऐसे शिक्षक बने जो कि शायद एक अच्छी दुनिया अभी भी जो हम सोचते हैं कि अच्छी दुनिया है 
उसकी तरफ हम बढ़ना सीखें जिसमें संवाद हो सके जिसमें लोगों को सुना जाए जिसमें लोगों के जिसमें हम लोग जहाँ जहाँ हम हमने अपने या लोगों ने हमारे लिए जो दरवाजे बंद किए हुए हैं उनको हम खोलना सीखें हाँ वो अभी भी हम बना सकते हैं उसके अभी भी हमारे पास उम्मीद है बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर इन सब बातों के कहने के लिए